The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We're coming to you live from Salem, New Hampshire, and today we are going to hash out triggers. This was a Scotty topic, and I'm kind of excited about it. Yeah, but one thing I wanted to say before I forget, I wanted to give a shout out to Cindy in Oakland, California. She sent us a great email, very inspiring. Got me all motivated today. I read this nice email. <laughs> Jess sent it over to me. Thanks, Cindy. Glad we could help you a little bit. Glad you're enjoying the podcast. Yes, yeah, Scott was all pumped up when he read that this morning. All right, first we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. <laughs> Y'all, there's four days left to order apparel. If you want apparel, click the link in the description. The URL is caninehealing.bullshirt.com. And I need to say that the dog apparel is tiny. This is a medium. It's small. If we still had Gigi with all that hair, I'd be putting her in a medium probably. The 3XL, Cousteau was sporting the pink 3XL the other day. Um, it's not like going to fit on a Mastiff. It's not going to fit in a Borbol, which we happen to have in right now, but it did fit on Cousteau. So if you have questions about the sizing for the canine apparel, let me know, but otherwise click the link order. There's only four days left. This is the only apparel we've offered all year. And I don't know when we're going to offer it again. And there's some good selections. So check it out. Yeah. And before we get into the triggers, I also wanted to mention the president's dog commander. <laughs> Commander's having some trouble. 11th bite. Yeah. And this is really driving me freaking crazy. He was so fired up about because, this last night. Because, you know, we deal with people that have do dogs that are biting on a regular basis. I've dealt with hundreds of homeowners, dog owners that have had dogs that have had bites, that have gone to the cities, that have pleaded and fought to keep their dogs, to keep them from being put down, to keep them from having to wear a permanent muzzle. This is over one bite. And... Uh, you know, the biggest fear we all have is that animal control or someone's going to come to your house and say, you have to surrender your dog because it's an aggressive animal. And this can happen in as little as one bite. But certainly if you had three bites, yeah. now it's become... You'd be getting a visit. Yeah, it's a dangerous dog, you know. And I'm talking about three reported bites. Your dog is quarantined. You guys know the routine. So the president has a dog in the White House that has 11 recorded bites. Why has nobody intervened here? I mean, the per if, if I had a client whose dog had bit 11 people, first of all, they wouldn't have the dog anymore. It would be taken away. Yeah. And second, why do they still have this dog? Because they're obviously not able to manage a dangerous dog. Yeah. You know, so it's just a... The rules should be even across yeah. the board, and uh, D.C. Animal Control should be showing up at the big White House and having a little chat. No kidding. And I think that uh, these Secret Service guys should be getting some big fat checks every time they <laughs> get, a, get a nip on the hand. It's Payoffs. like, give me a hundred grand. Yeah. And I mean, I supposedly Commander has a lot of triggers. We don't know what those are, but there's a little tie in there too. So when you were thinking about this, when you wanted to flush this out, you were surprised we hadn't done an episode on it. And I was too. What is a trigger to you? Like when you think of triggers and dogs and dog training, what is what comes up? Well, something that gets a, re a big reaction out of the dog that is... Um, usually predictable, like if the dog is afraid of kids and, the, and all of a sudden some kids come running at it, the dog gets spooked and startled and responds either in either a fearful or an aggressive way or, you know, just gets overstimulated by, or the thing, the other thing I was thinking of was, you know, a trigger for a dog getting overstimulated and jumping all over you is when you say, hey, you want to go for a walk and you reach for the dog's leash and the dog goes crazy. So you've created a trigger out of just reaching for the leash getting the dog now that jumps on you that you don't like, but you don't understand why is the dog doing this all the time. So, you know, identifying the triggers and neutralizing them yeah, and, and even avoiding them is a even, big thing. Yeah. Just, if you don't know how to deal with the trigger, the first thing I would say is start consciously avoiding it until you have a plan so that you can address it. Yeah, you we're going to put the way to deal with triggers kind of in, well, first you have to be able to identify it, but they're all going to go in different categories based on the level and, 
you know, what you're capable of and your dog's training level and everything else. But the Oxford Dictionary basically just describes it as an event that causes a response. You know, you're getting a response out of something. And to me, any sort of trigger, it's just from the dog going to neutral to going into a, you know, state of high heightened fear or high arousal or something else. So what is causing the dog to go to this, you know, certain spot? And if you think of protection dogs, if you're familiar with protection training at all or anything, you know, the whip becomes a trigger in IGP. It gets the dog fired up. The stick becomes a trigger and ring. You know, it gets the dog really excited about biting and everything else. But the dogs also have to be able to do obedience through these types of things and listen through those types of things and get neutralized to the triggers as well. So we're going to flush this out from a pet dog perspective and hopefully help you guys because the word trigger gets thrown around a lot in our industry. And yes, maybe your dog has a lot of triggers, but we can't have the dog live in a bubble and we have to be able to have the dog exist. And, you know, people talk trigger stacking and all this other stuff. How do we just deal with it? And how do we get our dog to be more, you know, neutral to the different triggers that it may have? So what are your thoughts to kick it off? Well, I think, um, again, just dealing with my clients on a daily basis, you know, dog reactivity on leash, dog, dog reactivity. So you're walking down the street with your dog and there's a house on the corner where there's a dog that's contained with an invisible fence that just barks and gets all territorial with everybody that walks by. And your dog blows up and is dragging you as you're trying to get by this house. And you're all stressed out about, I hope that other dog doesn't break the fence and come out and, or vice versa, your dog somehow gets loose. So that becomes a trigger. This dog, you know, you know that your dog's gonna blow up. And um, in that case, until you have a plan, I, I would just advise going instead Don't of coming out route. and taking a right, yeah. you take a left. Yeah. Just stop. Get, it just gets worse. It gets bigger and bigger. And the dog is anticipating it more and more. And it's not going to get better. It's just going to get worse in, the, in that context. Yeah. And even when you talk about dog reactivity, a lot of people will say like, oh, you know, my dog is going to react to a small dog on the street. Well, you don't necessarily know if the trigger is your stress, the way you're handling the leash when you see a small dog. You know, the, the, there's a lot of different things that go into play there. And sometimes when we show up to someone's house and we take the leash, we don't get the same response. And that's because the trigger is sometimes more related to the owner and the owner's, you know, emotional state and how they're handling the leash. And if you're pulling back on that leash, we've said it time and time again, you're going to get more reactivity on the leash. So that could become more of a trigger than just, oh, there's another dog. You start wrapping that leash around and you start, you know, getting your dog tied into you. They're going into this like protection type of mode. So be very conscientious of what the trigger may be. And if you're not sure, or you've never worked with a professional before, just have someone video you on this, videotape you on the street and start to see like, okay, when does, you know, the dog go from this to the red zone? When does the dog go, you know, over a threshold? Like what is, what is going on here and how is it escalating and why? Because that might help you kind of tweet it a part of it. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you, I had a, I got a, an older Malinois. I didn't get him as a puppy who came. I got him because specifically he had human aggression issues. And I was asked if I was willing to work with him and if I could bond with this dog, maybe compete with him. And I said, sure. And one of his big triggers was the collar grab. If you grabbed him by the collar and tried to stick him into a crate, he'd come right up at you and it would be a battle where the dog would either wind up unconscious, and I'm not saying that this happened with me, but it happened with somebody else, or you're gonna get really hurt. Like those are the two options, either the dog is gonna pass out or you're gonna get hurt. Serious issue. Yeah, and I knew that it was like this, you know, so I did a lot less Per, you know, this is the way I chose to deal with that dog is the tr a lot of the training was much less personal. I did a lot of electronic collar training into the crate, out, on leash. And so he, when he knew what was going on, he was stable and predictable. It was when you started changing things up a lot, he'd get stressed and then, you know, he could become unpredictable. So I worked with that dog for a couple of years. I competed with him. We, we passed trials. We did okay. But he had some very specific triggers. And, um, and you kind of avoided and them. And I avoided some of them. Uh, I worked through some of them, but I have avoided others because the battle was bigger than I was willing to deal with. And I didn't know that I could get to the other side of it. And if you can't get to the other side of it, it very likely will just be worse. Yep. I mean, it can get to a point where it's like you can't work with the dog because the dog doesn't trust you because he thinks as soon as he sees you, oh, you're going to 
come up and do this or that, whatever it is that he doesn't like. Yeah, you know? and that's an extreme case, but that's a case where Scott, as a professional dog trainer, chose to avoid it just for the safety of things. When we talk about neutralizing triggers, I think a pretty common one is the doorbell rings, right? So the doorbell rings, the dog runs the door, goes crazy. Start to pattern in, like, you know, the doorbell rings, the dog runs to its bed, the doorbell rings, you're training this. The doorbell is not something that, you know, you're just waiting until UPS comes or you're waiting until that pizza gets delivered. That would be some way that you're kind of neutralizing the dog's response. They're not shooting into this really high state of arousal. They're thinking, okay, the doorbell rang, I'm going to run to my bed, I'm going to get a cookie. That's a great way to deal with that type of situation. Another really common trigger, I would say, is when a dog is riding in a vehicle, you know, they're passing another dog or they're passing people and they're blowing up in the car. A lot of people have this problem. Start to create a different routine within the car. Either create your dog, put, you know, window coverings up. Start to manage that in such a way that just because you're in the car, it doesn't mean that whether you're going for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes, the dog can just blow up whenever it wants. Start to environmentally change the way the dog is riding in the car so it gets less triggered. And you can call that avoidance. You can call it neutrality. You can call it whatever you want. But start to cut that so it's not just, you know, running from the front seat to the hatchback and going absolutely crazy crazy the whole car ride. Can you think of some other super common ones? Yeah. I mean, uh, the um, nail clippers yeah, for a dog that needs one. to get their nails trimmed. We had, a, and nine out of 10 dogs uh, are not thrilled about getting their nails trimmed. You know, they deal with it. They don't fight about it, but they don't love it. And they'd prefer not to deal with it. I mean, that seems to be the standard. I don't care how much you uh, try to create a positive experience out of getting a dog's nails trimmed. At some point, you're going to clip the quick. It's just inevitable. You got four paws you got to deal with. But we had a dog uh, last month that had extreme reactivity to seeing the nail clippers. I mean, yeah. it was just it was intense. Not so we normal. do this with every dog we have. Not it. normal. And Jess is able to work with just a, just about every dog that comes in and get the job done. And the dogs aren't thrilled about it. Some of them. I mean more often than not, it's just a pretty mundane experience. It's not a big thing. But this dog was like fighting. And it was, I mean, it was like, if ever a dog should be medicated, you look at this one and say, this dog should be medicated yeah. for nails. But I um, took a towel and put the towel over the dog's head. And it totally yeah. calmed down. Yeah, like it when he didn't see the clippers, yeah, it wasn't the touching was okay. of the feet. Yeah, it, it was, was just, just seeing yeah. the clippers. And he's yeah. like, holy shit. He's like yeah. looking at the clippers coming towards his nails and... And he was just getting more and more worked up. But just like treating it like a cat at the vet, putting a towel over the dog's head, totally calmed down. She was able to cut all the nails. Everything was yeah, fine. Yeah, changed everything. And yeah. we avoided that visual trigger in a sense of the nail clippers because it was a visual trigger for that dog way more so than the sensation of touching the feet or anything else. I'm going to bring a Dremel on a follow-up class and see if I can make some headway. Okay, let's go to break super quick. And when we get back, we're going to talk more about triggers. Want to keep up with all the latest from the Quirky Dog Podcast like me and Murphy here? then make sure you head on over to the YouTube channel and subscribe. Or if you prefer to listen to The Madness, go on over to iTunes or Spotify and follow the Quirky Dog Podcast. And hey, while you're there, leave a rating and review and let them know what you think of the show. Until then, keep it quirky. Okay, so one thing I did want to mention is kind of when a trigger expands. So I like to think of this in the context of like Scott, you know, getting home from work. So you know, Cousteau, when he lived upstairs, now he lives in my office, he starts to key in on these little, like, you know, details of Scott getting home, and it sets him off. So maybe first it's just the door opening, oh, dad's home. And then he listens, you know, for the car, and then he knows when the car can turn into the driveway. Like, you have a trigger, like, oh, my dad's home, I'm super excited, and then it's expanding more and more and more so. Maybe if you live near a school, you know, the dog is triggered by kids walking by, but then all of a sudden, you know, the bus pulls up, then all of a sudden the mail gets delivered 15 minutes before the bus pulls up and this trigger is just expanding more and more and more. You need to be aware of these situations where the dog is keying in quicker, the dog is escalating sooner, and you need to intervene. Because honestly, a lot of the things that are triggers for dogs where they're racing up and down the fence, they're growling, they're barking behind a fence, that's what leads to a bite. And then when there's an actual bite, everyone's like, oh, it came out of nowhere. I had no idea what happened. It was, you know, crazy. This I never expected this. So you need to start really watching when your dog has a certain trigger and it's not just now the guy that walks by in a hat. It's anyone that walks by the house. It's, you know, they're running the whole length of the yard. You need to start implementing some new techniques to get those triggers smaller again. I just want to touch on that briefly because it is something to me that often expands. Yeah, and I would say if you have a dog that has reactivity in the yard, then I would really just advise a lot of management because typically you're not in the yard with the dog. So you have a dog in the yard, he might be sleeping for doing nothing, 
but then all of a sudden something sets them off. And like Jess said, usually it's a predictable thing that somebody comes, maybe it's not, maybe UPS comes, but you're not sure when it's within a certain window, a two hour window, and it doesn't happen every day. But, you know, I would be proactive in bringing the dog inside before school's out. Mm -hmm. So when all these little kids go walking by your fenced yard with sticks banging on the fence because they're little monsters trying to get your dog worked up, your dog is in the house. And when all that is passed, let them back out. Just try to start to neutralize things with management yeah. uh, rather than hitting the dog with an e-collar, looking out the window and hammering him with an e-collar while he's barking at kids and all that stuff. I would much rather that you manage the dog by removing him if you're not out there to communicate with him. Now, if you're out there raking grass, raking the lawn, getting leaves up, and your dog blows up, then through obedience, you should be able to say, hey, get your ass back here. Get go on lay the bed. Yeah, go do lay down and shut yeah. up. Yeah. But if the if dog's out there all by himself, trying to, in his mind, God knows what, protect the kingdom, yeah. You know, just say you're off duty, get in the house and, and take a break. Yeah. And repetition builds behavior. So working around certain triggers are okay, but we also don't want you avoiding things. And now you only can walk at 2 a.m. in the middle of the night with your dog. If your dog is triggered by other people or, you know, the environment or anything else. I mean, I'm sorry, people, the new buzz thing now is like, oh, like don't set the dog off for aggression. There are a handful of dogs, probably five to 10% of dogs that they show up at the vet's office and they're just barking just because they got out of the car. They see anything, the environment, a bird in the distance. They're just, they're automatically triggered by just being out in the world. So a lot of it is anxiety. Yes. A hundred percent. A lot of it is anxiety, but you need to start working through these things. And I'm sorry, but training does help your triggers. When Scott is talking about, you know, if you're out in the yard raking leaves, if that was a situation where we had a dog that, you know, we don't personally have dogs that would ra ra run to the fence and bark, we'd put the dog on a bed. So maybe the dog would, you know, woof once on a bed, but now it's stabilized. It cannot be running the length of the fence, barking its head off and, you know, getting itself more and more and more aroused. So be conscientious that like, okay, the dog's triggered by this. It's fearful of this. It's fearful when we pass people. Well, what does your loose leash walking look like? Honestly, I, I, do you have decent loose leash walking in your living room? Do you have decent loose leash walking in your driveway? Do you have decent loose leash walking, you know, at a parking lot of a grocery store where you live? That is a way to start working through some triggers of a dog that's fearful of wind and cars and strollers and everything else. What does it look like when you ask the dog to do loose leash walking? And if the dog doesn't have criteria for that, then of course, yes, the triggers are going to affect everything. I'm not saying the dog's going to love the wind because it's loose leash walking, but if it's focusing now on like, okay, mom told me with me or mom told me to heal, I have to be doing this. It can't be losing its mind and darting behind you because a car passed or even worse, heading towards a car because it's over aroused or, you know, wanting to run back to the house because the leaves rustled. Like we need the dogs to start to be able to deal with some triggers as well, because then trigger stacking happens really quickly. You know, oh, well, we're just outdoors and it's just too much for the dog. The dog just is overstimulated and can't handle it. So training helps triggers. Yeah. And it, along those lines, was it two days ago, I was at the vet's office with a client. Was it yesterday or two days ago? I don't know. It's been a long week. Two um, days ago. So Monday, the lady has Monday. a dog, a German shepherd that I had done some training with her a couple of years ago. And she had been doing, since I saw her, a lot of AKC group class agility and canine good citizen and a lot of different things, a lot uh, leaning towards food. And she has done very well. She got her canine good citizen. She does well in the agility. All these things were going really well. Her loose, loose leash walking around the neighborhood is good. Her off leash was much, much better. A lot of great stuff. But when she went to the vet, the dog would just blow his mind. He'd just mm -hmm. freak out. And there was no eating then. The food Yeah, would wouldn't take any too. treats now. Yeah. And the dog gets so stressed, the dog would start jumping on her. And she's a, an older woman. And so she was deathly afraid of getting knocked to the ground and having a serious, you know, accident of some kind. So she asked me to come out and do a class with her at the vet's office. I said, great. We met out there. The dog was really anxious and stressed out. I don't know why. I don't think the dog had had any real negative experiences at the vet. But we didn't even, you know, we didn't go in the building for 20 minutes. We worked on healing and sit. And I put a long line on the dog while she had her six-foot leash to keep the dog from jumping on her. We got the dog calmed down. We got her calmed down. The dog started taking treats. The dog's, you know, just decompressed. Then we went in, put the dog on the scale three or four times. And then she was able to do it all without me assisting, just her on the leash. And we worked through stuff. And what I told her for homework is I said, go out to the vet's office on Sunday 
when it's closed and do obedience in the parking lot because yeah. it's a trigger for the dog, but there's not going to be anybody else there. There's not going to be any other dogs. You're not going to go in the building. Just work on getting up to the door, having the dog sit, turn around back to the car, just like you would at a dog daycare drop off. That's a huge trigger for a lot of dogs to get overstimulated. The dogs act like complete idiots and get rewarded for that by getting loose in a dog daycare and playing with their yeah. friends. So the training aspect, just like we were talking about with the doorbell, if you want to change these triggers, you need to train outside of when you're getting in delivery. You need to train outside of when you're actually walking into the vet's office. You need the dog to start, and they're going to become more neutral just because of the repetition. They're like, oh, okay, this wasn't that crazy. Everything went better. You're changing their emotional response to these things by getting better reps and not having the blow-ups. This is super, super important. Something that you can't control as much, which is a trigger for a lot of dogs, would be like fireworks or thunderstorms or those kind of loud noises and everything. So, you know, people always are like, oh, my dog's deathly afraid of this. People that know ahead of time and some people medicate for the holiday and that's fine. If you know that there's going to be a thunderstorm or if you know there's going to be fireworks or something else, at least have your dog on a leash. Not to correct your dog, not to, you know, enforce this hard obedience or whatever, but if the dog cannot be running from, you know, right next to you, three stories up under the bed, the dog isn't going to be as fearful. They can be next to you on the ground. You can, if you do stepping on the leash, they understand that process. They understand to decompress there. You can put a thunder shirt on them. You can play music. There's different ways to manage that. But just because something's unpredictable doesn't mean that when it has first happened or when it starts to happen, then you can't intervene in a new way. Because we often just allow our dogs to do this self-soothing however they want. And, you know, shaking in a closet for three hours isn't healthy for anyone. So try to come up with ways in situations like that when you do know, hey, there is going to be a big thunderstorm. The clouds got really dark. Maybe we're going to get some booms. Start to intervene on the front end where, you know, the dog only has one room to move around, only has, you know, a six-foot leash on that you can pick up and you can start to manage the dog physically because that really helps with their anxiety. And it's the same thing we're talking about when we're talking about training. If you're super stressed about something, something going on with your family, something going on with someone's health, and then you get thrown into, you know, a busy day at work, that's, you're thinking about that. You're focusing on that. If the dog can be focusing on, okay, I need to be staying on my bed. Okay, I need to be doing my loose leash walking. Okay, I need to be holding my sit, stand, heel position. X, Y, Z, whatever it may be, the dog can only focus on so much at once. So you're taking away the stress of the trigger by the dog actually being able to channel its energy into something that it can do and that it can win at and that it can be productive with. So be conscious of these little things. Yeah, and I would say with you know regard to the weather and the thunderstorms and that kind of stuff you know dogs are all animals are much more in tune with barometric pressure and things like that I mean it's so crazy how uh, natives when like there was a tsunami coming I saw a video and these natives and they weren't primitives but they were just natives to this island and they saw that they didn't there was no sense that there was a big wave coming but they saw animals all starting to retreat. Mm -hmm. Everything was starting to go up into yeah. the hills. So the people being in tune with the animals said, hey, something's up. Let's start backing up off the beach. And then sure enough, you know, when you could see the, the signs that, that we would sign being not so, that we would notice being not so in tune with nature, by the time you see that, it's almost too late. You don't even have time to get out of the way because now there's this friggin' surf coming up and pummeling the first row of houses on the beach. You know? Yeah, that's true. Be very conscientious of your dog's early actions and try to intervene as soon as possible. Okay, so barking is a common trigger. Um, some aggression. This is a common one we hear a lot, you guys, and I don't understand it, but if you have aggression within your household, um, you have certain triggers that, oh, if I get too close to the dog's face, it's going to growl. If I wake the dog up from slumber, it's going to growl. Start managing those triggers differently. We're a hundred percent for if your dog is going to come after you or another being or other animals in the house while it's sleeping, that dog should be sleeping in a crate and it should not be sleeping on a bed. If the dog is, you know, um, has this specific trigger of he doesn't like it when I do this, not so much resource guarding, that's kind of a different training venue, but you know, he doesn't like it when I get in his face and, you know, make this noise. Stop doing that. Like, why are you setting your dog up? So it's going to actually show aggressive responses towards you. When you have triggers, and don't let your kids do it. Tell yeah. Them to knock when it off. you have triggers within the household where you're getting this aggression in your, you know, family unit, your int intimate unit, 
Stop creating those triggers and stop having that happen because we do not want this aggression building up within the household and expanding outside of the household and all this other stuff. Be very conscious of that. Muzzles can be a big trigger for certain dogs. Dogs have gotten them on to have, you know, adverse things done to them, all this other stuff. Of course, counter condition with food if you can. And like we always say, you're going to put the muzzle on when you don't need it. Don't put the muzzle on just to go into the vet. Put the muzzle on Take it off, feed breakfast. Okay, great. It's, it's becoming more neutralized. Be conscientious of, and be able to have a list of things that bother you and bother your dogs. No, triggers for arousal happen all the time. I guess we could point to those things more so than anything else, but Scott's dog, Jimmy, very motion sensitive, loves when we rotate dogs. A trigger for him is he hears the crate door. He'll start to, you know, pop into arousal and he wants to grab something so he can hold something in his mouth and contain himself. We call it his anger management tool. When you see these certain triggers, fine, that gets him going. Can we control him during that? It is very important that, especially when you have arousal triggers, you can control your dog. Dogs that are really aroused by little animals like chipmunks or squirrels or something else, if they get all perked up, can you then recall your dog and say, hey, come here, let's go in the house? Or if they start running towards something, can you recall your dog back away? Arousal triggers can be just as um, damaging or just as hard to deal with as these triggers that will create aggressive responses or fearful responses or anxiety responses or anything else. And you have to know how to target those things. And when you see them, great, know them. We love to create arousal cues in our dogs. It's honestly how we get Jimmy to put his ears up for photos. We start tugging with a dog behind the camera and then he's like all perked up and ready to rock. And th th we love knowing what gets our dogs amped up and gets them going and gets them wanting to dig their feet into the ground. But how are you controlling those things? Be very conscious of that because so often everybody just thinks, oh, well, it's his ball. It doesn't matter. He gets excited about his ball. That's when you're going to get a cruciate tear. That's when things are going to get out of hand. You need to be able to control the arousal triggers just as much as you need to be able to control the fear and the anxiety and the aggression triggers. Yeah, and uh, sometimes controlling the uh, arousal is simply channeling the arousal. Yeah. You know? So instead of trying to squash it and say you're not doing shit and you have to be a little soldier uh, with dogs um, that like to tug, it's great to be able to use a tug toy to help them burn off their stress in the tug game if they have something that gets them worked up and then you can redirect them and have them bite on something. I have a, a person, a neighbor, who has a, a black uh, pit bull that I walk my dog down the street in the morning and he's come in the opposite direction and when his dog sees my dog, he goes crazy. Any and dog. it's so it's not predictable. Just our dog, yeah. Every yeah, and it's just this is just the way it's gonna be. And uh, his dog will turn and grab the leash and he's got a real thick leash. And then he just takes the dog past me like a fish. The dog's just hanging off of his leash, just tugging and tugging and tugging. And I'd much prefer to see that dog tugging on the leash than being lunging <laughs> and focusing on my dog. Yeah. He's not focusing on my dog anymore. He's taking out his frustration or whatever's going on in his head into that leash and he's got a good grip on it. And I, and we just kind of laugh and say, hey, how you doing? And he just takes his dog Moves and goes along. by. And my dog looks over at that dog like, what the hell's wrong with him? <laughs> and a lot of you know? people can't get that engagement, right? So maybe you need to create more distance with that engagement. You know, the squirrel's out, the dog's not going to tug. But that's definitely a way that we channel our dog's arousal and make sure that we keep it in check is you're going to engage with me. You're not going to engage in this external environment, what you want to engage in. And just be conscientious of what your dog's baseline is, right? Like I was talking about, can you walk, you know, in your neighborhood when it's pretty calm out? Can they just be out? Out and about because you know the reason that somebody that is a very nicely tempered person cuts somebody off in traffic and flips them off and screams at them it's totally out of character it's because they got a text you know from their boyfriend that morning and it, it pissed them off you know their mom called and left this crappy little message the kid was late for school you know you get all this trigger stacking where like all of a sudden shit hits the fan and someone who's you know pretty normal human becomes completely dysregulated right off the bat if your dog's becoming dysregulated very frequently and trigger stacking is happening on a daily basis almost because your dog has so many triggers and your dog can't handle that much, I would try to change your dog's baseline so they can be more tolerant of the world. And I'm sorry, but we do this for a living. We do this time and time again with dozens and hundreds and thousands of dogs. You're just going to go out. We're going to go to Home Depot and we're going to go for a walk. We're going to get in the pool and we're going to go swimming. You're going to get a a muzzle on and you're going to get your nails cut. The, the dogs start to take direction from someone who's stepping up and giving them confidence and saying, oh yeah, that wasn't so bad. And then their baseline of being able to live and what they're able to deal with just gets easier for everyone as far as in existence, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. When I think of that trigger stacking, um, what comes to mind 
are the really good dogs that are good with kids and real social, good with, you know, good in social settings, the kind of dogs that nobody ever regulates or manages them. And the dogs, like, you know, kids, young kids, two, three-year-old, four-year-old kids are, like, on the dog's back, bouncing up and down, like, doing all this kind of crap. And the parents are saying, look how great the dog is. Yeah. Look how good this dog is, you know? And then the and dog I'm just snaps. Thinking, yeah, and it's like... Well, yeah, the dog's being real tolerant. That doesn't mean the dog loves it. And that could be, we talk about stacking these things. Well, that's some pressure the dog's dealing with. He's like, ah, oh, the kid's on my back again. You know, well, I'll deal with it. But then all of a sudden, maybe it's a kid's birthday party. Now there's like three kids jumping on the dog. And all yeah. of a sudden, the dog bites somebody. And they're like, we never saw that. That dog has been bulletproof. We don't understand what happened. Well, you, you know, you're allowing the dog to be abused by kids yeah. and the dog needed a break. Yeah. So it's Whether the same with... Whether your dog's great with kids or not, we would go to avoiding It's kids the same with old dogs, old dogs, and you get, a young, you get a new puppy or you get a young rescue dog. And you have a 13-year-old dog. And that's why you got this young dog because you know your older dog isn't going to be around and you don't want to be without a dog. So this is a typical scenario. And they play together and you're like, oh my, they love each other. This is great. In, uh, and it is good. But then the older dog is burnt out after 10 minutes. Like, I, I just need... I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough play and my, my arthritis is starting to bother me. I'm kind of yeah. done. And the young dog just keeps going in, going in, biting, nipping, you know. And finally, the old dog turns around and, and Nails starts, starts fighting with the yeah. dog. And people say, oh, yeah, you know, he, the young dog needs to learn how to behave. Well, I'm not a big proponent of that. I think it would be better to be stop when everything's going well and separate them and, and give the old dog a break. They, you know, in our house, and I think in most houses, the senior dogs get a free pass on many things. They don't have to have the best obedience. You know, they get to be 13, 14 years old. You know, uh, it's more- The rules more, are different. Yeah, I mean, I'm fluffing their pillow for them. I'm so grateful they're still hanging in there and they're surviving. And, you know, by that time, having a dog for that length of time, it's a, it's a, it's a special thing to be able to share your life with a dog for, 13, 15 years, it's an amazing thing. So you want them to be comfortable and, and just stress-free. You know? Yeah, and that would be a time when we're going to intervene. We're not going to expect them to be neutralized to something that maybe wasn't a trigger that then became a trigger because it got to be too much. So I hope we helped you guys a little bit. This is something that I want you to be conscientious of with your own dogs, with your own training, with your own life. Dealing with your own triggers as humans is good, and knowing what triggers you and having different ways to cope with them is important. Do not forget about apparel. This is the last week to order. Only four days left. Click the link in the description. And if you need us in person, we work from Portland, Maine, to Manchester, New Hampshire, to Boston, Massachusetts. You can email us at studio at thequirkydog.com. And in the meantime, keep it keep quirky. It quirky. <laughs> See you next week, guys. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.